Hi guys, uh, welcome to our webinar. So I am Hirshita and uh, Prabhushi will be joining with me for this webinar. Uh, in today's webinar, we will go through the tooling best practices for integration experts. Uh, this is the fifth part of the webinar series uh, for Integration Studio webinar series 2019. So uh, let's move on to the agenda today. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, we'll describe how to develop an integration scenario following best practices. Uh, then we'll move to move on to a supported project and artifact types and their usages. Then uh, we'll explain about naming conventions, uh, then the use, useful shortcuts we are using, uh, then native logging practices, and uh, message transformation conventions and uh, ID concepts. Uh, in this webinar, we will go through a real life scenario explaining the best practices which are vital for your business integration. So let's check the scenario we will be uh, discussing through, throughout this webinar. Uh, let's say a developer needs to implement a user registration flow. Uh, then he wants to test the configurations in his QA environment before deploying them in the production environment. Uh, some of the configuration in these two environments can differ due to their infrastructure. Uh, such as uh, endpoints, data source, uh, things like that. Uh, uh, this is the diagram of uh, the scenario we are going to implement. So let's say a user sends a request uh, to register a user. So it uh, arrives to EI integrate engine. Uh, then from the EI integrator, we are doing the uh, necessary mediations. Uh, after that, we are sending it uh, out uh, to uh, the uh, backend system which uh, does the registration processing tasks then uh, we are getting the response out of it uh, in the meantime we are sending an email also so describing uh, whether you have uh, successfully registered to the system and uh, further uh, in the meanwhile uh, we are storing the de details registration details into the database so we move on with the, this scenario and uh, explain the best practices uh, from that uh, meanwhile. So we have created a small video uh, for demonstration purposes, so it will be easier to present. Uh, so we will start the integration studio now. So uh, as practice, uh, please use a new workspace for each use case. So from the, uh, so that, that's because uh, uh, we can organize our use cases properly if we use a, a different workspace for each of the use cases. So let's say we are doing, now we are doing the user registration use case. So we are creating a new workspace uh, for that. So, uh, so uh, in our integration studio, we have several project types uh, we can use. Uh, it, uh, it depends on the use case we are developing. So mainly we have a Maven multimodal project, ESB solution project, composite application project, uh, data service, BPL, BPMN projects. So we have to choose this uh, according to your use case. So let's say we are developing uh, some use case uh, with proxies, APIs and stuff. We can use a USB ESP solution project. Uh, then uh, if we are developing some uh, uh, BPM workflow kind of project, we can use BPL or BPM and project accordingly. So it uh, highly depends on your use case. So we have to choose uh, whatever the project we need to develop. So these are the supported project types uh, we have in integration studio. Uh, from the getting started page, uh, so uh, if we started uh, integration studio, uh, we are getting the getting started page. Uh, from the getting started page, uh, you have to uh, select uh, Maven multimodal project. Uh, let's create a project uh, from Maven multimodal. So it's listed under miscellaneous project types. So you have to create a new Maven multimodal project from that. 
So for um, even multi-module project, we have to provide group ID, artifact ID, and such things. So for that, uh, you have to follow um, even uh, group ID and artifact ID naming conventions. Uh, like this. So. So we can see now uh, the Maven multimodal project is uh, created. Uh, usually, it's recommended to use a Maven multimodal project for your use case. So we can wrap up all the projects needed for the specific use case under one project. So in uh, I mean uh, in uh, development I mean uh, in production scenarios in real world scenarios, it's uh, very easy to use a Maven multimodal project since. Uh, uh, we don't have to build uh, all the projects one by one uh, because uh, uh, otherwise it's uh, if we are doing some automation for that uh, it's uh, hard to build one uh, project one by one so we can easily use a maven multimodal project and build a single maven multimodal project and uh, it will build all the projects uh, listed under the multimodal project so that's the reason uh, we are recommending recommending to uh, use the maven multimodal project So we have to uh, select a new uh, ESP config project now. Uh, so uh, that's because uh, we are uh, in the in our use case, uh, we are creating uh, ESP artifacts. To, so to hold the ESP artifacts, we are creating uh, this ESP config project uh, under the uh, Maven multimodal project. Uh, it's a sub module under the Maven multimodal project. That's why we used a uh, new uh, from right clicking the Maven multiple project. So, so we are defining the name for the project. So in uh, all of the projects, uh, we'll describe uh, about the naming convention later. So as for now, I'll say uh, uh, for as a naming convention, uh, use the use case name uh, followed by the uh, project type uh, for the project name. So in here also, we are following the same uh, naming convention. So we have defined uh, user registration system, then common artifacts. Uh, we are defining it as common artifacts before because uh, we have uh, uh, this project is created to hold the, all the common artifacts. So that's why we are defining the common artifacts. Uh, so you can see user registration system is the use case. Uh, and the common artifacts is the project type for this. So as I said earlier, you have to define the Maven group ID and artifact ID according to the uh, Maven uh, naming conventions. Okay, now uh, we can see the uh, ESP config project is also created. Uh, then we will create a composite application project as a sub project to Maven multimodal project. Uh, you can go to new other composite application project. Then uh, we have to follow the same uh, name conventions for this project name also. The Maven name conventions, as I stated earlier. So, this project type is created to export the ESP artifacts we created in the ESP config project. So, this is like a exporter project. 
uh, to for the ESP artifacts we are creating such as proxies and APIs. So we can deploy these uh, uh, composite applications as you may already know, composite applications directly to uh, our uh, AI server. Uh, then uh, let's have, take a look uh, at the artifact types available in Integrator Studio. So basically uh, inside the uh, ESP uh, config project, we can define these artifact types, uh, proxy service and REST APIs, those are the most used uh, artifact types. Then uh, sequence, endpoints, inbound endpoints, message tracer, message store, schedule tasks, and so on. So we have to uh, select these artifact types also according to the use case. So let's say we are uh, doing a REST uh, based integration flow, we have to use a REST API. So uh, such like that. Uh, so we are, if we are doing uh, implementing some uh, listening thing, uh, listening to uh, VFS or things like that, we can use inbound uh, things like that. So those are the artifact types we have. So. Uh, always make sure you follow these naming conventions as a practice. So as I stated earlier, these are the naming conventions we follow in Integration Studio. So uh, for folders, uh, usually we use the project name, then the fold followed by folder name. So you can see the sample here, student information system is the project name, then the folder is libraries. So the fold, uh, complete folder name should be student information system libraries. Uh, so we are uh, recommending this practice because uh, uh, when we see a folder, a folder only also, we can uh, see uh, what pro project it belongs to and things like that. So uh, in the, for the registry resources also, uh, you have to follow this folder structure we have defined here, uh, project slash resource type slash subject resource type. So in the sample also, we, you can see student information system is the uh, project, then we still list the resource type. In, uh, in the bottom sample also, student information system is the project, uh, resource type with uh, schema is the resource type, then we still list the sub resource type. And so, so for project names, uh, if, it's a, uh, if it's not a, uh, a child project or sub module or something like that, if it's a flat project, then you can use just the project name, as you may already know. Then uh, if it's a sub-module, uh, so it, like a nested project, uh, what we have used in uh, this scenario, uh, you can use uh, the project and the module name. So you can see uh, as a sample, in the sample, uh, student information system is the project name, and the data service is the sub-module. So the sub-module name should be student information system data service. So uh, for the source files, uh, as you may know, uh, in uh, integration ESB projects, uh, we are uh, creating source files for proxies, APIs, and other things. So for those, for those things, we have to define project name underscore file name underscore type dot extension. So you can see uh, project. Uh, so you can see in this sample, uh, project name should be student. Uh, file uh, file name is the student, so it may be the name of the sequence. Then the type is sequence. Then the extension. Uh, usually the extension is XML, like that. Uh, so uh, it's better if you can follow this naming convention. So it's uh, very clear uh, to understand, and it will increase the readability. So you can see uh, there are some uh, useful shortcuts we have listed here. So most of them are uh, usual standard st shortcuts for copy, pasting, cut, save, and other things. Uh, add block comments and remove block comments, uh, remove line, unselect is also some uh, standard uh, commands, uh, standard shortcuts in conventional IDs. So in uh, Integration Studio, you can uh, search in workspace uh, using Control Shift R in Linux or Command Shift R in Mac. 
and uh, use the zoom functions uh, you, uh, with the uh, control plus uh, in uh, Mac and Linux both. So we will move on to the uh, scenario we uh, we've been developing. So as for the artifacts, we will first create the fold sequence. As you might already know, uh, this is used to handle the error flow of the mediation. So we are creating the sequence like this, new sequence. Uh, we are giving the sequence name. Uh, and I want to point out the aiming conventions we are following here. So uh, the user registration is the uh, project name uh, and the fault is the uh, file name. And the sequence is the file type, I mean, resource type. So uh, I'll uh, explain the log me about log mediator. Uh, this is a vital part in uh, every uh, integration scenario because uh, log mediator is the one we are using if we want to log something in our integration flow. So uh, mostly this is used uh, in the message flow as checkpoints, uh, as you may already be using. Uh, in de when developing the integration flow, we are just uh, using log mediators to check the state of the uh, state of the integration uh, at that point, uh, things like that. So, but uh, this is not recommended to use in production setup, uh, except for in fault sequence. Uh, the reason behind is uh, the in production setup we don't we might don't need uh, many logs uh, in happy paths. So, but in fold paths, if we occur any error, we might need to uh, log that log the re uh, to uh, backtrace the uh, reason for that error. So that's why we are recommending to, recommending uh, not to use uh, log mediators in production setup. So, uh, but in fold sequence, we have to use that. Uh, this is uh, very important to use within uh, the fold sequence. Uh, that's because uh, we can isolate the issue with that. Uh, then uh, in uh, log mediators, uh, when uh, logging the fold sequence, I mean, uh, when logging the fold flow, we can use these inbuilt properties uh, to retrieve the error details. So if we log these error details, we can just isolate the issue, isolate the error uh, we we had occurred. So uh, that's why it's very useful uh, when developing actual integration scenarios. So we have added the log mediator. Uh, so we are defining the log level as custom because we have custom properties to log. So this is how we find. So if you are unclear about the implementation, uh, you can always follow the documentation uh, of uh, WSO2 EI. So all these implementation details are listed there in the documentation. So we are, we are adding several properties that we might need to log if, the, if an error occurs. And that's why we are defining those. So as you, as I mentioned earlier, we are getting the error message out of uh, message context. An error code. The error details. As I said earlier, these are the inbuilt uh, properties uh, we can use uh, when an error occurs. Then the exception. And uh, as a practice, uh, please add uh, descriptions for every mediator. Uh, this will increase the readability and uh, make the integration flow 
much clearer so if uh, any other uh, developer or uh, any other one uh, reads the integration flow they can easily understand uh, what is happening and why we are using this uh, uh, specific mediator so it's always uh, recommended to it's a best practice to uh, define the description for each of the mediators so we have added a drop mediator also so that's depend that depends on the use case so in our use case we just want to log the fault log the error and drop the uh, any messages coming out of it so that's uh, so as you have seen the practice is to log the details in the fault sequence so so now we are creating a rest api uh, so it's better if you can follow the same naming conventions uh, when uh, referring to the APIs also. So this is also a resource. So we are defining it like that. Uh, then defining the context. Uh, for the context, uh, it's uh, implementation specific. Uh, next in this scenario, uh, we have to add the message transformation. So there are many mediators in EI uh, for transforming the message. And you may wonder what is the ideal mediator for uh, each scenario. So for your scenario, uh, this graph will clarify about that. So uh, as you can see in the graph, uh, if your message format is fixed, uh, let's say you have a fixed message format, and there are a less number of external inputs. So uh, it means uh, if you just want to change less number of uh, things in the message format, then the ideal mediator should be payload factory. Uh, then uh, if the original message has repetitive elements that should be processed. I mean, uh, if, uh, if the original message has uh, some kind of arrays or something like that, some collections like that, so you can uh, use for each mediator but uh, when uh, doing the changes doing the transformations in each of the iterations you have to use a payload factory inside the each iterations so that's how you have to you can uh, transform uh, each repetitive element so for each repetitive element is uh, uh, processed by payload factory mediator and transformed into the uh, desired uh, uh, message format uh, then uh, if you need to uh, add or remove a part or the whole message then you can use the enrich mediator so then uh, uh, let's say your transformation logic is very complex and uh, and it's performance critical then we suggest to use a sslt mediator because uh, uh, for performance critical uh, transformations we are uh, suggesting that so if you need to change the structure of the data in a message, let's say it's a simple transformation or convert and transform in one data format to another. Let's say it can be XML to JSON or XML to CSE, some things like that. Uh, we just need to, some simple transformation. Then uh, it's uh, very easy to use data mapper. Uh, so, uh, and for the large file transformations, uh, we suggest to use Mox mediator. So uh, let's assume that payload factory, uh, I mean, uh, payload comes with the repetitive element. So so in our scenario also, uh, what we have assumed is uh, payload comes with the repetitive element. 
that's why we decided to uh, go for voice mediator uh, as we explained earlier uh, so uh, this will be used together with the payload factory mediator uh, then uh, for, uh, for me uh, i'll explain more about for each mediator so for each mediator loops over the sub messages and merges them back to the same parent element of the message uh, but uh, this for each mediator does not allow using call or send or call out mediators in the sequence uh, so uh, we have to use an iterate mediator instead of that uh, if you are using call send or call out mediators uh, to call a back end or some kind, things like that so uh, and another thing to point out is uh, for each mediator does not split the message flow like in iterate mediator uh, and uh, it guarantees to execute in the same thread until all iterations are complete. So uh, we can, uh, so let's get back to the uh, development. So in the uh, mediators panel, uh, we can uh, select a palette. I mean, uh, mediators palette. We can select a uh, mediator and drag and drop, as you might already know. So, in the mediators, mediators mediator palette, uh, we can uh, we have a search option. So, to fire the mediator search option, you just have to type the first letters of the mediator. Then it will filter out uh, all the mediators starting from those letters, and uh, you can easily select uh, what mediator you need. So that's because uh, there are around uh, 20 to 30 mediators. So uh, to filter, it's easy if you can filter out uh, using that mediator search option. So we are selecting the for each mediator from that and drag and drop it. So we are providing for each ID for that. Uh, you can always refer to uh, uh, WS2EI documentation for implementation details. We are not uh, that much focusing about implementation details in this webinar since uh, this webinar is to uh, describe about the best practices you might want to follow. So you can define the format you need. Uh, with the payload factor mediator. So as I stated earlier, the payload factor mediator should be used uh, along with the uh, payload factory, uh, I mean for each mediator. So in that. So we can define the expressions. Uh, uh, so to replace the uh, dollar mark for the format. So we have created the payload. Uh, we have transformed the repetitive element like that. Since we have a repetitive element in our uh, payload. So uh, then I'll describe about the clone mediator. So clone mediator basically clones a message into several identical messages. So uh, we can use a call mediator in the target scene. I mean, uh, in clone mediator, we can define several targets. So it will clone the message into uh, all the target targets, target sequences. Then uh, it will fire the sequences parallelly. So uh, use a call me we can use a call mediator in the target sequence to bring the responses back into the in sequence so we are uh, in our scenario also i'll uh, explain that uh, uh, bit uh, i'll explain that uh, now uh, so in our scenario also uh, we are doing uh, three outbound outbound messages so that's why uh, we need a clone mediator uh, so uh, uh, we have the diagram uh, explaining that. Uh, this is uh, also similar to iterate mediate, but it splits the message into different parts. So, 
so you can see uh, how we are implementing implementing the uh, outbound messages uh, we are specifying the number of branches we might we need to uh, replicate the message into uh, it's tree as per our diagram and uh, in the clone mediator uh, clone target we are specifying the call mediator so that call is used uh, to uh, send the message into the back end i'll describe that uh, so in this diagram you can see uh, after the uh, transformation is done which we done with uh, for each and payload mediator we are first sending the message uh, back to the back end message uh, to the back end so that's where the registration processing is done so we are just sending the request to back end that's why we used a call mediator inside the clones first target so other two targets uh, exist uh, to send the email and uh, send the message to database So as I stated earlier, uh, we have used a call mediator here, but uh, we have uh, several mediators uh, which we can uh, use to send a message uh, uh, to a backend or to external third party uh, endpoint. Uh, so uh, main uh, three mediators here is uh, send mediator. Uh, the use cases we need to use send mediator is uh, when we need to uh, send a message uh, and if the response come to the out sequence or to the specified receiving sequence we might uh, need to use the send mediator uh, so send mediator uh, uses non blocking transport so when uh, and uh, when using send mediator we can't define any uh, mediators after the send mediator so that should be the end uh, mediator of a, uh, in sequence so uh, that's also should be considered when, uh, uh, when selecting send mediator to your integration flow. So if there's no other uh, processing should be, if I mean, uh, if there's no other mediators should be done in, in sequence, uh, we have to use, uh, we can use a send mediator. Uh, but if we have uh, other uh, processing to be done in, in sequence, we can use a call mediator. So in call mediator, it sends a message and the mediation flow will continue with the next mediator after the send operation is done. So, uh, so as I said earlier, if you have any other transformations after the, after the uh, message received uh, in, in sequence, uh, we can use call mediator. So call mediator is the recommended uh, mediator for service chain in scenarios. Uh, and uh, call mediator also uses non-blocking transport by default, but we can define define it uh, to blocking also. Uh, then uh, we can uh, we see uh, we have a call out mediator. Uh, this also this mediator is also uh, behaves similar to call mediator, but this uh, the changes uh, I mean differences. Uh, this is uh, using uh, blocking transport uh, by default. So, uh, so uh, when we are doing uh, the call from callout mediator, the performance is not good as call or send mediator because uh, uh, of the blocking feature. So uh, the tra underlying thread uh, which sends the message out uh, will wait until the message comes uh, in the blocking transport as you may already know. So that's why we are uh, recommending uh, call and send mediators uh, for if, if there's no specific reason to use uh, blocking transport. We have now implemented the backend call mediator, but uh, for the call mediator, we have to define an endpoint to which backend to define which backend uh, the request is going. So that endpoint uh, I'll describe uh, 
uh, much more about this endpoint we are using uh, in uh, in our scenario uh, in QA uh, environment our endpoint is different so we are using a local host endpoint in our QA environment but in product environment uh, we are using the actual endpoint actual backend we want to use so that's why I, uh, we are using uh, we are just ex uh, trying to externalize this i'll describe it uh, more later so now uh, actually we are doing to uh, do what we are doing now is uh, defining the endpoint so so in most real world scenarios uh, we use qa dev environment uh, for development and uh, testing the uh, artifact uh, after successful testing phase only, we'll be moving to a uh, product environment. Uh, but we can't create ESB artifacts again for product environment. Uh, so specifying each of the endpoints again and again uh, for product environment. So, uh, uh, so the best practice uh, to reduce this effort is to externalize the endpoints, as I stated earlier endpoints or data sources data sources are also same uh, usually uh, in qa environment and uh, each of the environment we are using several data data sources uh, like in prod db and uh, qa db dev db something like that so data sources also we are defining several things and endpoints also same so we are using uh, it's uh, different in uh, all the other implementation can be same but uh, points and data sources and other things can be different so that's why uh, we are externalizing it to a registry project uh, so we can have separate registry projects uh, with endpoints data sources and another registry project with uh, qa endpoints and data sources so what we are going to do is we are creating a registry project and uh, for uh, defining the product endpoints and another registry project defining the qa endpoints You can see we are creating the registry project. Mm, we are following the naming convention also. So it's the the best practice for these scenarios is to use uh, externalize those uh, endpoints and data sources into several registry projects. We will describe how to use that now. So we have created the QA registry project. Now we are creating the prod register project. So now we are creating uh, the composite applications. Uh, which we are using to hold the uh, different uh, registry artifacts. Registry artifacts in the sense uh, registry, uh, I mean, prod endpoints and uh, QA endpoints. Uh, we are defining uh, two several composite applications which holds QA endpoints and prod endpoints. So if we define like this, uh, so when moving to prod from low environment, only thing we have to do is replacing these endpoint references. So then we can't, we don't have to do anything to uh, the endpoints, endpoint definitions. So as I stated earlier, uh, we are using a false sequence for API. So it's always better to use a custom uh, false sequence for API. So we are just pointing the false sequence we have used uh, in this API. So in the registry projects we have created for QA and prod, 
now uh, we are referring to the QA register project. We are creating the endpoint as we have described earlier. We have cre uh, creating the endpoint uh, like this. We are defining an HTTP endpoint with the resource name according to the naming convention. Like this so in here you are defining a local host endpoint that as i have stated earlier uh, this is qa endpoint so we are defining it as local host this implementation specific in in prod also we are doing the same thing So we are defining the new actual backend endpoint, prod endpoint, like this. Now after that, uh, we are referring the created uh, endpoint with the named endpoint in the sequence we have created earlier in the code and data. So in the name endpoint, we can refer to registry resources like this and select the prod endpoint. So as you can see, uh, if you need uh, if you need to deploy it in a QA environment, we just have to uh, change the reference of this named endpoint. Then we we can have the it uh, pointing it to. Uh, QA endpoint, I mean local host endpoint. So now we are we have def uh, defined prod endpoint. So I'll hand over uh, to Prabhushi to continue with this uh, webinar. So thanks, Heshita. Um, so the the Eclipse platform comes with um, some of the concepts. One is the perspective. So basically, a perspective defines a set of views and their positioning. And also, it has uh, some toolbar customized customizations to develop some of the artifacts. And uh, our WSO2 Integration Studio uh, has uh, different perspectives, uh, to uh, which are specific to different um, per, uh, purposes. For example, WSO2 ESP graphical uh, perspective is used to develop uh, all the ESB uh, related artifacts. It is basically uh, consisted of all the views and tools that are used to develop all the ESB artifacts. So in addition to that, uh, we have uh, other perspectives such as uh, WS2 welcome uh, perspective, data mapper, uh, etc. So uh, Uh, in the top right corner, you can see the currently selected perspective. And uh, if we go to uh, Windows, perspective, open perspective, other, there we can see all the perspectives that are there in the integration studio. And uh, let's assume that we have accidentally closed some of the weaves in the perspective and we switch some of the perspective. Uh, so then uh, we can't find some of the weaves now. And uh, we need to restore the uh, perspective again. That can be done by uh, going, uh, first we have to select the uh, required perspective in the top right corner. And we select perspective, then we go to the window uh, perspective and reset perspective. And then we can uh, get the default structure of the uh, perspective back. And also we have the weaves concept in Eclipse IDE. Uh, weaves are basically different window segments uh, that are there in the Eclipse IDE. Basically, uh, mainly the weaves are used to uh, provide navigation of the information in the workbench. Uh, in our integration studio also, we have several weaves uh, such as Project Explorer. Uh, mainly it is used to uh, represent all the projects in the uh, workbench and holds its uh, folders and artifact files. 
in addition to that uh, we have uh, several other weave such as template guide uh, console weave uh, uh, properties outline etc and if we want to search or open a view we can simply go to window show view and other there we can search for the views and we can open them from there so uh, another uh, important option that is available with eclipse is uh, linking with editor option uh, that means uh, if we have an artifact open in our uh, window and uh, we don't know we have to locate that object uh, or the artifact uh, in the uh, project so uh, when we uh, don't know the location we can simply go to the link with editor button on the top of the project explorer view once we click on it we can see uh, it will locate the, uh, the artifact in the project explorer view and in scenarios where we don't use multi module uh, projects uh, we can uh, simply click on this uh, link with editor button even though the project is actually collapsed uh, so let's uh, get back on to our use case uh, now we saw how to implement uh, calling the backend service for user registration process so uh, another requirement is to parallelly send an email uh, while uh, doing the registration process so uh, to achieve this uh, we will first uh, create a sequence uh, because uh, in this case uh, sending an email can be sort of uh, identified as a sub module in the main scenario so we can uh, isolate that uh, functionality or the re small requirement so uh, we can uh, implement all the uh, implementation related to sending an email in a separate sequence so that we can even reuse the same sequence again so as heshita mentioned we will be following uh, the naming convention that we mentioned um, so that we can easily identify this article artifact so uh, in order to uh, get the send email process done we will be using ws2 gmail connector uh, when we are using connectors there are uh, several things we have to know for, uh, for best practices uh, we should always uh, use secure wall when uh, in scenarios when we use uh, user credentials or any other sensitive data uh, there we will be uh, basically uh, use the secure wall implementation in ws2 ei we will only call uh, the reference or the secret alias uh, within our synapse configuration without hardboarding the sensitive data and also in scenarios where we want to repetitively use the same uh, sensitive data among uh, different members in a cluster we can simply uh, refer uh, locate that uh, information within a shared registry location and use it from the registry instead of uh, uh, referring it again and again in the synapse configuration and also another best practice is to, to use the dollar ct x context instead of using the get property when we want to evaluate an expression because the dollar ct x always uh, get the uh, evaluate using the message context at that moment but uh, for the get property function it can uh, even go to the registry table and search in the registry if that uh, particular key is not available in the message context so uh, searching in the registry can uh, be a bit uh, heavy so it can degrade, degrade your performance so better to uh, note those factors when you are using connectors so uh, first of all we have to add our connector into our workspace to get that used in our development flow so we will connect to the ws2 connector store and download the gmail connector once uh, downloaded we can see it's there in our tool palette then we can uh, easily drag and drop the uh, functions of the connector so we will initialize the gmail connector as i mentioned uh, before uh, we should always use the secure vault implementation uh, instead hard coding the passwords or any other sensitive data so here we will be 
uh, using the secure vault uh, secret alias of uh, each parameters that are uh, needed to initialize this uh, Gmail connector. So we have uh, parameters like client ID, client secrets. Uh, so once we uh, initialize the Gmail connector, Um, we will be adding a property mediator to define the message context, uh, message uh, body. Because uh, finally, we will be using this property to retrieve uh, whatever the content that needs to be sent to the message, uh, to the email content, email subject actually. So uh, then we will send use the send function in uh, Gmail connector. There we will be uh, setting all the parameters that are required to uh, send the email. So as the message body of the email, we will be adding the uh, defined property using the dollar CTX. Uh, property. So uh, once the mail is sent, uh, we don't want to propagate the response coming from the Gmail connector further in this uh, sequence. So we will be using the drop mediator uh, to drop the message. And uh, as Heshil mentioned, uh, it's, uh, it's always useful to add uh, descriptions within each mediator. In addition to that, we can always use uh, comments within our XML uh, artifacts so that it would be more readable for any user. So uh, initially we downloaded the connector into our workspace so that we can use it for development. Now we need to actually deploy this ESB uh, Gmail connector uh, into our environment. So in order to develop the connector, we have to create a, a connector exporter project um, and bundle whatever the connectors we need to be deployed in each uh, environment. So here also we have to uh, follow the conventions uh, we mentioned earlier. Once we created the project, uh, then we uh, we have to add the uh, connectors into the project. We already have uh, the GML connector in our workspace, so we can add the connector. So uh, since we de developed all the mail sending uh, functionality in a separate sequence, now we have to link that sequence with our main API configuration. To do that, we will be using the sequence mediator and uh, we will be uh, simply referring that uh, created sequence in our workspace. So uh, get on with our scenario. We have another requirement to send uh, the details into the database uh, parallelly when we are sending the mail and calling the backend service. So in order to achieve that, we will be using uh, WSO2 Enterprise Integrator in build database uh, mediators. Basically, we have two mediators, DB report and lookup uh, mediator. These are basically used to sim, uh, for only for simple queries. Uh, DB report can be used to execute some insert queries, while DB lookup can be used to uh, get uh, execute sing, select operation with uh, single row data, but if we have a more complex scenario, such as uh, if you want to retrieve more data, more rows within the table or nested queries, we should always use the data services. So here we will be using the DB report mediator. Once we add the DP report mediator, we have to configure uh, with our database configuration. And uh, as we used in the connector, we can always use the secure vault implementation to uh, 
to avoid uh, hard coding the password values within the Synapse configuration. So, uh, then we have to define the database name. Once we configure the database, we have to add our required uh, query to be executed. So in this scenario, we assume uh, all the data that are uh, needed to execute this query is coming in the uh, input itself. So we will be uh, adding all the XPath expressions uh, to get the data from the input and use it uh, in our insert query. So uh, we will get uh, the basic user details such as name, uh, email, city, etc. from the input. So uh, once we are done with the database processing, we should always, uh, in this scenario, we assume that we don't need to uh, proceed with the response coming from the database. So we will be dropping the message flow from here using the drop mediator. Uh, in After this uh, execution, since we use the call mediator, we should navigate to the out sequence using the loopback mediator. It is basically used to direct the in, uh, message flow from in sequence to out sequence. Uh, we should note that we cannot use any other mediator uh, after the loopback mediator uh, within the in sequence and also we cannot use the loopback mediator in the out sequence because it is uh, only used to direct the message flow from in, in sequence to out sequence. So uh, uh, in this scenario, we are using a custom mediator. Uh, when we are using custom mediators, we should note that uh, we should only use it when uh, we cannot uh, use uh, any other inbuilt mediators to get that work done. So uh, when we are using uh, implementing class mediators, we should be careful on the performance and also uh, me memory leaks that can happen uh, with our code. So always stick to the Java naming conventions and best practices uh, when you are developing the uh, Java class mediators. Uh, to achieve that, we have the mediator project where we can follow uh, Java naming conventions uh, for package and class names. Um, We can use the camel case for class defining class names. And, uh, and also we should always follow the Maven uh, conventions to define uh, artifacts, uh, IDs and group IDs. And, uh, and once we uh, create the project, we will get our class mediator implementation, which extends the abstract mediator of Synapse. Uh, it will inherit the mediator method from the abstract mediator where uh, we get the get an object of the context. So we have to implement all the uh, business logic or the implementation within this mediator method. Mediator method. Uh, uh, it's better if you can use uh, uh, the Java conventions such as uh, Java class uh, design patterns, uh, camel cases, documents, etc. So once we are done with the class mediator implementation, uh, we can refer it using the class mediator in our tool palette. Uh, we have to define the uh, prop, uh, package name and class, class name. And also uh, we can add the description to make it more uh, readable. So after that, uh, so we are done with our implementation. Now we want to respond back to the client. So we, for that, we will be using the respond mediator. Uh, it, will, uh, it will basically send the respond back to the client directly. So in, with the res, uh, instead of res, respond mediator, we can also use the send mediator. We should note that uh, we cannot use any other mediator of respond or sequence mediator. 
So uh, that's it about uh, developing this scenario. So uh, WSO2 EI team is planning to uh, release uh, this uh, Synapse testing framework in the upcoming uh, release because uh, it is important as a best practice to always test our uh, Synapse integration uh, flow uh, using some uh, unit test. So we are uh, implementing this uh, framework at the moment uh, still we have a developer preview version of this feature so basically this feature will allow you to add mock services uh, so in a mock service basically we can add uh, uh, add whatever the mock uh, url endpoint and also any other uh, uh, inputs or outputs that are expected from the mock service So these mock services can be then used in our use uh, test cases. So we can mock uh, our response like this. Uh, so once we develop the mock services, we can create a test, test case. Uh, here we can select the dependency artifacts from our artifacts within the workspace. Uh, that will be used within the test case. So uh, if we have already developed any mock services that needs to be used, then we can use it uh, here. And then uh, we can uh, add the asserts and uh, any other requirements that need to be tested here. So uh, as Meshita uh, implemented, uh, we had three composite applications, one for basically for the common artifacts and two other for environment specific artifacts. So once we develop everything, including the test cases uh, artifact, uh, we have to uh, select artifacts according to uh, each requirement. So the common composite will have all the common things, uh, including the connector. Uh, class mediator and other artifacts and uh, QA or the prot uh, composite applications will have their own endpoint endpoint configuration. So once we select uh, and uh, done with our implementation, we should always use some uh, version controlling mechanism um, to manage our uh, configuration. So it will be useful uh, in cases where there are uh, many people developing the same scenario within a team maybe. So we have committed the changes. So let's test our scenario. So uh, let's assume our QA environment is uh, up and running at the moment. So we will be adding it as a server, as a remote server. So uh, we will add the Tomcat port and URL for the QA environment server. So we have added the server. Now we can deploy our artifacts onto that server. So we can see the artifacts are getting deployed. So let's see the database uh, table at the moment. So we don't have any uh, data there. So let's send a request so we can see the message uh, email is getting sent and also if we check the database uh, table we can see uh, a new entry has been entered into the into the data service so that's it about the tips and best practices uh, of developing uh, enterprise integrated uh, scenarios with uh, integration studio. So uh, it's time for Q&A. So please post if you have any questions at the moment.
ini in this case corner media we have a nani block Uh, so we are getting a question uh, what is the particular use case of uh, call out mediator uh, so it is basically using our blocking transport which is uh, like uh, we will be sending the request to a backend and we will be waiting that thread until the response comes back uh, so so it will be blocked until the response comes back uh, instead of the call out mediator we can even use the call with the blocking through option uh, with our new enterprise integrate. Uh, yeah, we have another question. Uh, in our environment, we have both XML to XML transformations and XML to JSON transformation. What is the best recommendation for our transformation? So, uh, so, uh, in this case, uh, uh, if you if your environment is performance critical, uh, you should always uh, use some mediators like XS, uh, XSLT when you are transforming from uh, XML to XML. And if you are using some XML JSON transformation, if your uh, uh, payload is small and it's a small mapping you should be done then uh, you can use the data mapper but uh, it won't be appropriate if you use it for big messages or uh, performance critical uh, transformation so better if you can go with the xslt uh, when the xml is involved with your uh, message flow and uh, and if the uh, environment is performance critical uh, which means uh, the integration flow uh, is performance critical then uh, it's better if you can use uh, xslt mediator uh, and uh, if the performance is not uh, that much critical and uh, uh, transformation is uh, so simple then we can uh, it's better if you can use a data mapper mediator since uh, it's very easy to map uh, using data mapper mediator. Uh, we have another question uh, we have a small integration for flow uh, do we still have to use uh, maven multimodal projects so if the uh, if the integration i mean uh, if the integration flow is a small one and uh, if, uh, it's not uh, uh, you they are not using any uh, ci cd process or something like that uh, you can uh, ju uh, just uh, develop the integration flow without uh, Maven multimodal pro uh, project also. The advantage of using Maven multimodal project is uh, just uh, we can uh, build it, build all the uh, sub projects at once. 
with a single maven train install i mean maven build command so that's the reason why we suggest to use maven multimodal so it's easier to uh, if you have a continuous integration and uh, other things uh, so since we are running out of time uh, we will wrap up for today so thank you for joining the webinar i hope you enjoyed it uh, please register for our upcoming webinar on uh, vs code 2 thank you